Tomorrow we are opening uh, a photography exhibit uh, by Sai Tao and Jim Vu. And um, if you're not able to come tomorrow, you can cheat and, and have a look at the exhibit tonight. We won't tell anyone uh, that you've looked. And there's still signage and stuff that will go up tomorrow. But the, the photographs are all downstairs and are really beautiful. And it's called Being Mong. Um, and they're part of the, the second generation that's trying to figure out one foot in American culture, one foot in Hmong culture, and how to define for themselves who they are. So it's great that we're, we're thrilled to have their work uh, here. Um, Tuesday night coming up, uh, Chris Lehman will be here with his new book, uh, Slavery's Reach. It's a book that means a lot to us here in this part of St. Paul because Chris has discovered that a number of the streets in this neighborhood were named by slaveholders. Um, you know, if you wondered, why is there a street named Magnolia on the east side of St. made some slaveholders' heart go pity pat to have a street named Magnolia and Hyacinth and so on. So Chris has really dug in deep, and uh, it's a lot deeper than just Lake Calhoun. And um, so come Tuesday night and, and hear Chris and, and learn about his research and, and his book. So um, Kalia has asked me to read the bios of everyone who's going to present tonight, so I'm going to do that. Um, I learned long ago that it's wise to do what Kalia suggests, so <laughs> you can't go wrong. So we're going to hear from, and I'm going to read them in alphabetical order, I don't know what order you're going to read it. Um, Ty Coleman is a Cave Canem and Vona Fellow. Um, her writing has been published in Bum Rush the Page, Riding Shotgun, The Ringing Ear, Blues Vision, which many of us know, uh, How Dare We Write a Multicultural Creative Writing Discourse, and A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, another one that many of us know. Um, Mapping Our Potential, a poem as a spatial and temporal mapping of human experience is her TEDx talk. Her book, Working Towards Racial Equity in First Year Composition, was published this year. And she's an assistant professor of English literature at St. Kate's uh, here in St. Paul. And then Sue's not going to want this book back after I. Yes. Okay. Daniel, are you back here in the back? Mm -hmm. How am I missing this? It's real short. It's real short? Oh, in the eight hours for what we will, my sister from the labor movement, Daniel Regender prefers to argue politics while knitting something deliciously complicated and drinking something velvety. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I will just have to add to that that for a hot minute, Daniel was editor of the St. Paul Union Advocate. Um, too bad that it wasn't longer than a hot minute, at least for us here uh, in St. Paul. Uh, Catherine Squires, and I heard Catherine, was it last week or two weeks ago down at Channel 2, holding forth uh, about issues of housing justice and racism here in the Twin Cities and the role of the media um, in either revealing or hiding what goes on. Uh, Catherine is an author and professor at the University of Minnesota. She has published multiple books on the politics of race, gender, and media, including The Post-Racial Mystique and the edited collection Dangerous Discourses, Feminism, Gun Violence, and Civic Life. She lives with her partner and children, and I do have to say that one of those children has done a lot of History Day research here at the East Side Freedom Library, and it's been a joy. Um, she lives with her family in St. Paul, where she's always on the lookout for interesting birds. Um, and last and hardly least, Calculia Yang is a Hmong American writer, the author of The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir, winner of the Minnesota Book Award in Creative Nonfiction and Memoir and Reader's Choice, and a finalist for the Penn USA Award in Creative Nonfiction 
and the Asian Literary Award in Nonfiction. Her second book, The Song Poet, also won the Minnesota Book Award in Creative Nonfiction and Memoir, as well as being a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Chautauqua Prize, a Penn USA Award in Nonfiction, and the Dayton's Literary Peace Prize. And I, I want to add to that that it's being turned into an opera uh, by the Minnesota Opera. So get your tickets uh, this coming season. Um, and her first children's book, which she also introduced here at the Side Freedom Library, A Map into the World, and copies are available at the book table from Subtext Book. Um, a book about refugees in America is forthcoming. And it, that was such an amazing night that you brought a map into the world here and someone got up in the audience and, and talked about her relationship with the family that you had written about. And it, it really solidified the sense of how we are. This place is part of a community. And it's so great that Kalia and Aaron and the kids have moved back to the east side and are part of the community too. So thank you all for coming, and I'm going to turn things over to our brilliant writers, and we're ready for a good ride. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody this evening? Good. good. Okay, good. Good. You're responsive. That's good. <laughs> I'm gonna have you go first. Okay. <laughs> My name is Ty, and I just want to thank you for coming. I also want to thank Kalia and Shannon for putting this work together along with the University of Minnesota Press. And um, all the contributors, I'm very honored to be with you. I was telling Kalia before we started, it seems like this time is about revelation, right? People telling stories, things coming forth at a micro or macro level, and we're having the opportunity to heal, having the opportunity to learn things about ourselves and to move forward. And I'm happy to be a part of that work. My essay is titled, um, Tilted Uterus, When Jesus is Your Baby Daddy. You can laugh. <laughs> I use humor, uh, as a lot of people of color do. Um, you laugh to keep from crying. My husband's name is Emmanuel, which means uh, God is with us. I'm a fifth generation Catholic in recovery, so <laughs> humor is the only way to deal with the uh, inconsistency of that, and I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Stevie Wonder in a song titled As has a line that says, you can't say you're in it, but not of it. And so sometimes we are in and of things that are oppressive, but we still have to admit that we are, we are a part of it, right? So a lot of my symbols uh, come from that. All right. And I'll just read some expert excerpts and jump around. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah, right. All right. Don't you ever let a man do to you what your father did to me. My mother would preach to us daily until I left home for college at the age of 17. And you best believe that by high school, I had Planned Parenthood on speed dial, and I knew the quickest CTA bus route to the nearest clinic. Although I didn't fully understand it then, my mother was trying to tell me in her own way and in her own words that she understood that my ability to have agency and control over my uterus, my choice to procreate, and my mental, emotional, and physical health would directly connect to my ability to access my dreams, autonomy, liberty, citizenship, and equity as a black woman living in this world. When I first met my husband, I was living in sin, and he's my second husband, and so I was already um, committed a cardinal sin by getting a divorce, but that's another essay. <laughs> and when I met him, I was like, oh, I'm just going to have fun for the summer, and um, here I am 20-something years later. 
It was the summer of 2000, and my pregnancy was considered high risk because my OBGYN diagnosed me with uterine fibroids. I woke from a deep sleep feeling period like cramps in my stomach, and my mattress was shaking. I slept that night with my head at the foot of my bed, which both my well-mannered grandmother and superstitious grandma would not have liked. Grandma always said that you should never sleep with your feet closer to your bedroom door than your head. She said it was very rude to let the bottoms of your feet be the first thing that greeted the spirits if you were so lucky to be graced with a visit from the dead during the night. Sleeping with my head at the foot of my bed was the only position where my pregnant body could feel the muggy August Iowa air being pulled into the hot, humid basement apartment by my cheap Walmart window fan. At almost 20 weeks pregnant, the smell of everything made me sick. It seemed that I could smell and taste someone eating a banana from a mile away. My boyfriend with Jesus' name was working the night shift at Krispy Kreme and wouldn't be home until well after midnight. When Emmanuel came home from work, I regularly made him take off his uniform and shower before he was allowed to enter our bedroom. He and his work clothes reeked so bad that I was convinced that he was just getting paid for mixing and frying sugar and shit, glazing it, and selling it as donuts. <laughs> that night, I thought the bed moving was him, but I sniffed and didn't detect the DEFCON odor. I knew he wasn't home yet, and that I was alone. I assumed that the mattress shaking was nothing and happily closed my eyes into more funk-free sleep. The bed shook again, and I looked to my right toward the bedroom door. My eyes opened to a pair of knees covered in chocolate brown slacks. Don't ask me how I knew that the person was black skinned, had masculine energy, and wore a really nice 80s television sitcom style cable knit sweater with patterned hues of beige, chestnut, cocoa brown that matched his neatly pleated sack slacks. I didn't look up to see his face, but I intuitively knew that he was pointing over me toward the green wall behind me. I turned away from the pointing man to my left and faced the wall and saw nothing but the rotating shadows of the street lights reflecting from the window fan. But I did hear a baby crying. The crying seemed to stop as soon as it started. I was wide awake. Immediately, I turned back to my right and the man standing at the foot of my bed was gone, just like that. So the next day, on the way to Iowa, on Highway 35, my water broke. And um, by the time I went to the doctor, they thought it was a possibility that the sac could inflate again with fluid, but that didn't happen. So they observed me for a week, and that I had the option um, to give birth or for them to do a DNC, and I lost the girl. So I'm pregnant again, and we are in Minneapolis now. And as you can tell, I have a thing for dead people. And at that time, I was a big fan of Sylvia Brown, and my poor husband, he kind of understood what came with me. She was alive during this time. She was speaking in St. Paul, so of course, we had to go see her. Sylvia Brown, and can I just say the editor didn't know who Sylvia Brown was when they were editing? I'm like, what? <laughs> you don't know who that is? <laughs> Y'all know who Sylvia Brown was? Yeah. Okay, rest in peace. <laughs> Sylvia Brown, a prominent psychic, was scheduled to come to the Twin Cities in 2001. And unbeknownst to Emmanuel, I splurged and bought tickets for us to see her. Pregnant again, I was about 20 weeks along, and we were living in an apartment in South Minneapolis. We were both working and in school. The arena where Sylvia Brown was speaking was full to capacity, and Emmanuel and I were seated on the main floor in the back. By the time we had been together for over two years, he was used to my fascination with spirits. Plus, he was named after Jesus, so how could he not be as well? 
That night, Sylvia Brown held a lottery for all the ticket holders to choose what lucky ones would get to go to the stage to ask her a question directly. I was not one of the lucky ones. I had two chances because Emmanuel told me that he would, give, he would have given me his ticket if his number was called. I told, I told y'all he was sweet. That's why I ended up marrying him. <laughs> anyway, Brown led the entire auditorium through a guided meditation. And she advised everyone to individually ask in their heads the question that we would like our higher power, in my case, God, universe, to answer for us. Will my baby make it past 25 weeks? Will my baby make it past 25 weeks? Please, God, will my baby make it past 25 weeks? I kept asking this question over and over again in my head like a mantra, a prayer. Although these questions were a part of my guided meditation with Sylvia Brown in that moment in the auditorium there in St. Paul, sitting next to Emmanuel, this question had been my obsession since we found out that we were pregnant again. The guided meditation with Sylvia Brown ended. I felt refreshed, and Emmanuel and I drove back to our basement apartment in South Minneapolis. That night, I was awakened again by someone shaking the bed. We had graduated to a full bed, and I was lying flat on my back, and my right side was on the edge. I looked to my right, and there was that same black man with the brown pants and sweater that I first saw in the summer of 2000. He had returned, but this time he was not alone. There was someone standing next to him to his right, dressed in a glowing white robe like a Roman toga. Again, I seemed not to lift my eyes high enough to see their faces. The person in the white robe had an open book in his hand, and he lifted his right hand and he pointed directly to my stomach while the black man in brown looked at the man in white. The black man in brown then jumped into my stomach and my whole body shook and vibrated from my tummy throughout my entire frame and a feeling of complete peace and knowingness fell over me. I knew then that I had watched my child's soul enter her body and that the baby I was carrying right then and there in 2001 was going to be all right. I looked to my left and saw that Emmanuel, Jesus, had slept through the entire thing. <laughs> I realized in that moment that back when my bed shook during that hot, muggy August night in 2000, my daughter's spirit had come to tell me, Mommy, not yet. She was letting me know that it wasn't her time, but trying to explain to me that she would return. And on that night in 2001, her soul did just that. As badass as I pretended to and wanted to be, I decided that I couldn't be a fifth generation recovering Catholic with a Catholic baby daddy named Jesus and not get married. <laughs> With an eighth month full belly, Emmanuel and I were married at the Hennepin County Courthouse. My baby brother Ronald and my sister with her heart-shaped uterus, because I have a tilted uterus, she has a bicupsis uterus, which is shaped like a heart. I know it's all kind of messed up. <laughs> and she had two children. Um, my sister with the heart-shaped uterus stood as a witness. Our daughter was born 33 days later at nine pounds and 21 inches long. I prayed during my 12 hours and 17 minutes of labor that I would see my mother who had died in 1997. I didn't. And I named my daughter after her anyway. Thank you. My baby daddy's name is Brian. <laughs> So, a little less interesting. Um, so, I'm really glad to see everybody here tonight, and looks like nobody slipped on the ice. Uh, I'm going to read just a section, not jump around, um, and we'll see how that goes. So, my chapter is called Calendar of the Unexpected, so every section starts with a date. March 2001. 
My friend from graduate school called to catch up with me in the winter of 2001. For some reason, I decided to go ahead and tell her. I had a miscarriage. Oh, how far along were you? She asked. Uh, eight or nine weeks, I stammered. Then there was a pause, a silence, a hesitation on her end of the line. So it's not really a miscarriage, right? I mean, it wasn't really a baby yet, right? Though she was hundreds of miles away, I think she could sense my face reddening or could hear my heart pounding and stomach twisting and gurgling in the effort to maintain a steady tone as I replied, it was to me. I remember sitting there in a the straight back dining room chair, looking out the floor to ceiling windows of the home we were renting. It was a modernist retreat in a small wooded development with its own human engineered lake near the banks of the Huron River. It had become my escape from the office, from well-meaning people, from the hospital. Looking out at the slim branches and trunks of the pine and birch and hemlock trees for hints of nuthatches, downy woodpeckers, and chickadees clinging to the bark, chirruping and honking in the gray light on their quest for insects, keeping me company, keeping my mind occupied until Brian returned from work on the winding river road. A few weeks before her phone call, I am lying on the exam table, cramping my neck to look at the sonogram screen. The gynecologist taps on a gray circular form. You see right there, blighted ovum. The gynecologist withdraws the sonogram wand and begins, expl begins explaining what will happen next. Over the next few days or possibly weeks, when my uterus expels the blighted ovum, the non-developing fertilized eggs, the blob of cells that has ceased dividing and complexifying and growing. She pushes her stool away from the table, tosses her gloves into the waste can, and goes to the sink to begin washing her hands. All the while, she continues explaining what will happen to the blighted ovum. It will detach from the blood-rich uterine wall, hormones will trigger contractions, and it will be pushed out, discarded, disposed. I will bleed, I will cramp, I will feel pain. I may need surgery if there are complications with the detachment. I must look awful because when the gynecologist finally finishes her recitation of the blighted ovum's scheduled demise and turns from the sink to look at me, she squints like she's never seen a face like mine. Do you want to call someone? She asks. I have three more appointments with this gynecologist. At each one, I bring up how I'm still feeling tired, having strangely long periods, and I can't get pregnant despite trying the prescribed wait, trying after the prescribed waiting period. I've read these symptoms are possibly thyroid issues, I say. She shrugs it off and suggests I'm more likely depressed, that I should try antidepressants, and I should keep trying to get pregnant despite how awful I feel because I'm getting closer to 30 and it's harder after that decade begins. My hair is falling out. I've gained a lot of weight. My periods have extended to almost two weeks of bleeding. I can't think straight, but I know it's not depression. I try to remind her that it might have to do with my history of endometriosis, that maybe I have a hormonal imbalance. She continues to dismiss what I describe, what I hypothesize about my own body. I change doctors. I wait for six weeks to see a reproductive endocrinologist for a full hormonal workup. I get many vials of blood taken for testing right after I turn in my paperwork. After the blood draw, I meet the doctor. This doctor asks lots of questions, different questions, and he listens to my answers. He doesn't try to tell me what's wrong. He says we'll wait for the tests and we'll know more. I get a voicemail from him two days later. Catherine, your test results show a serious thyroid problem. You need to pick up a prescription as soon as possible. Please talk to my nurse for instructions if you can't reach me at this number. It turns out I have Hashimoto's disease and have had it for a long time. My body had attacked its own thyroid gland, decimating its ability to make crucial hormones, hence the extended periods, hair loss, fatigue, weight gain, and infertility. The nurse tells me, with your levels, there was no way you were getting pregnant. I'm relieved. The miscarriage wasn't my fault, despite the accusation built within the word. I begin my thyroid replacement medication. I lose weight. I take vitamins. March 2002. I'm pregnant with triplets. I'm pregnant after my new doctor's interventions, which included a round of follicle-stimulating hormones to reboot my ovaries after they went dormant from thyroid nosedive. The doctor asks us, asks us if we want to reduce the number of embryos to reduce the risks caused by a multiple pregnancy. Brian and I say no simultaneously.
July 29th, 17 and a half weeks pregnant. I wake up from an afternoon nap and go to the bathroom. I see a lot of blood on the toilet paper and some substance I have never seen before. I rush to the phone to call the triage nurse, just like I was instructed to by my high-risk obstetrician, Dr. Vandeven. Do you see membranes? The triage nurse asked me. What do they look like? There's blood and, I don't know, some kind of mucus, I reply. I've never been pregnant with non-blighted ova, so I have no idea about membranes. It's probably just spotting. Call back if you have cramping or contractions. She is blasé. She seems unconcerned, like she has other patients with real problems to see. I say, okay, and hang up. I take a nap. But when we sit down to eat dinner that evening, my body starts thrashing and churning out of control into early labor. Somehow, Brian is able to help me to the car, and we head to the hospital. By the time we get to the hospital, my cervix is dilated two centimeters, flat and open. The amniotic sac of one of the three children is sagging into the opening. I had seen membranes that afternoon, after all. The attending physician goes to page my obstetrician. Dr. Vandeven comes in and asks us to discuss if we want to try to preserve the pregnancy or terminate it now at 17 weeks. He gives us a 10% chance of survival for the triplets. Brian and I reply, preserve the pregnancy simultaneously before Dr. Vandeven can even leave the room to give us time to talk in private. This is what happens to you when your cervix opens up too early and you want to try to save the fetuses inside rather than terminate the pregnancy. You get put on a bed, tilted head down at 5 to 10 degrees to take pressure off the cervix and ease the placenta back inside. You get drugs to stop contractions. You get a large IV shunt attached to your veins for antibiotics to stave off infections and for fluids to stave off dehydration, which can bring on more contractions. You have a catheter inserted because you can't get up to pee. You lie like this for many days until the doctors think there's a chance to place a cerclage in your cervix, to sew it up to everything inside. So I lie upside down on my back, hooked up to tubes and needles and monitors for days. My world was officially off kilter. I was literally on a different axis than the rest of the maternity wing, on another plane, like the diagrams of vectors moving through three-dimensional spaces in the math books Brian used to prepare for teaching undergrads. We had to create our own map of this world, setting up a routine in an upside-down environment. Thank you, Clarence. This always has to go down a little bit for me. Yes, oh, perfect. Thank you. Yep, that's, that's good. Thank you all for being here. Peter, thank you for having me one more time and having all of us. Uh, now, for those who don't know, this was my childhood library. This is the Irland of Hills, so I spent many afternoons here in this section um, looking up the books that I wanted to read, the books that I, I needed to read, to ward off my loneliness, to make friends with, to find ways into the world that we lived in. Um, so it's been good coming back, introducing my work now for those very same shops. Shannon gave me a sorry that she couldn't be here tonight. Uh, her mom and dad are celebrating their 50th anniversary, so she's in Michigan. So I'm here for the both of us, um, which is something that we've learned throughout the process of editing this work, that we have needed to be here for each other. Uh, this isn't a book that one person could have edited alone and definitely one woman can definitely. So thank you. I'm gonna read actually from my mother's story. I, we start out this collection with um, Lu, the great Lucille Clifton, the only American poet to have ever been a finalist twice for the Pulitzer. And then an essay by her daughter, Sydney Clifton. And we kind of bookend it with uh, writing about myself and then my mom. So I'm gonna read uh, a little bit from my mom's side. It's called Either Side. My mother had seven miscarriages, and she has seven living. And um, in writing her story, I had to learn about how she tried to visit the seven who didn't make it. My experience of motherhood began gently, for all that I've lived in worlds full of fear and death, 
For this, I am thankful to have received the sweet blessings of life. What happened after is like a flood. I was heavy with my girls in my arms, their hands layered over my heart. I could not have prepared for what would happen for the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth child that I lost, or as the Americans call it, miscarried. In Hmong, we call it Tuaminua, to spill children. It does not matter what language we're expressing in. It is the language of loss, the language of almost but never, the language of forever and ever. The six miscarriages that happened in Thailand happened all in a row. They happened at a time when I did not have much food. When my body was so thin, the wind blew me into a curve of bones, a hollow bow around my belly, always burgeoning with life, unable to hold it safely inside. Each of the babies came out sometime in the middle of the journey. They were dead upon arrival. All were formed enough so that we could tell they were baby boys. All of them were thin and wet, slippery like fish. They came in waves of pain that reminded me I was alive, each in turn reminding me of the price I had to pay to live. How do I describe the experience now, nearly 30 years after the fact? I was young and I was hopeful. I was poor and I had two living girls to care for. I was with a man who loved me enough, but was also learning how to love himself and live a life where he, could, he would never be everything he was afraid to aspire toward. We were all refugees living on borrowed land, given food three days a week, expected to wait out the years. A day at a time for a possibility of life somewhere we'd never been. Already divorced from the time when I had been a girl, I had become a woman full of the traumas of the war and the happenings in the confines of the camp. I was a woman without options, a woman who had made a decision long ago to choose life no matter what, and who had to live in the travesty of that truth. I was a woman who gave up on herself sometime in the space of those losses, a woman who tried to kill herself, even with her beautiful daughters and her husband by her side, because she could not look upon a life where she was the source of so much death. I had gone into a fight with B the night before. We were fighting so much to stay together, to stay in love, to stay alive in those years so full of nothing. My girls were sound asleep, sound in their father's love. The fight must have been stupid, because I don't remember it now. But then all I felt was the eruption in my heart. I woke up early the next morning in a gray dawn. It rained in the night and the earth was wet. The door to our sleeping quarters that we had cracked open after our fight to air out our love, carried the flower blossoms from faraway places to my nose. In the gray, I saw my husband, his arms stretched across the bodies of our sleeping children, a cover against the night, the cold, and the camp. In the early morning, I put my cold feet on the damp earth, and I slipped them into my flip-flops. Outside, most of the camp was still asleep. The early roosters crow their morning calls, Hungry dogs lurked in the shadows between the houses. I knew only the early morning merchants were up and on their way to the camp market. I knew that the camp market, <clears throat> they sold packets of pills that fizzed in the water. The pills were used to clean silver, silver that I didn't own. Silver like the traditional mall necklace that my mother had given me when I married B, a prized possession that I lost in the Mekong River on the night of our crossing because I held tighter to my child than the token of my life is on others. As I walked to the water jar near the landing of the share patio to brush my teeth, comb my hair, I was quiet and dreamy. My steps were unsteady on the stairs. They felt weak. I had just had a miscarriage the week before. Which one? I no longer know. All I recall is that I felt pale, bloodless, and cold. The cold was something I carried in my heart. At the water jar, I brushed my teeth with the cold water, washed my face with a wet towel, and combed my long black hair with a plastic comb. I secured the thick strands in a bun at the back of my head with a hair clip. Then I stood very still. I waited for a few minutes for some other family members to get up, to hear perhaps B call out my name or one of my daughters murmur for me in her sleep. But that morning there was nothing but the quiet of a world 
that would continue with or without me. I could see the great mounds of Hmong people on the faraway hills, the men and the women and the children who had died naturally, died from sickness, or died because they had killed themselves, bare places among the green grass. And it felt to me that they were the only ones at home in this temporary place, the ones who weren't leaving, the ones who would defy the governments of the world, who had told us that we were refugees, that we belonged to no nation, that we were people floating far in the hopes of finding a home. I smiled at the defiance of the death. I smiled at my own rebellion in response to the life I had been living. I was at peace with the task I had set before myself because I believed that this is what the world wanted of me. I thought about the babies I had lost, each in turn a sliver of life the size of a cup of corn, the length of a banana, the width of a cup of tea. I thought of how each had died inside of me. My womb had become a casket. I thought about how each had been buried somewhere, free from ceremony or ritual, from the greetings and the goodbyes we granted those who had lived, who had been loved. I understood there was no room in my poverty for that kind of goodbye. I felt that I could not survive another goodbye. I took careful steps on the slippery earth toward the road that led to the market. My flip-flops were attracted to the earth like a magnet. Raising first one foot and the next was hard, but I persisted. I thought most about my mother on that walk to the market to the stall of the old woman who sold the silver cleaning pills. I'd seen many times before. My mother, whom I remembered then as an old woman, only because I was too young to understand the process of age. My mother, who had loved me gently and well, who had given me on my wedding day the best of everything she owned, who had told me not to forget her, who said, her voice shaking, when you have children of your own, you will understand how much I love you, how much I will miss you. It was the thoughts of my mother that made the tears in my heart surface on my face. I was sorry I could not return to her alive and well, my children around me laughing and loving. I knew that I was about to commit the biggest crime against her. How many times has she offered herself on the altar of death so that I might live? After my father died, she had looked upon my brothers and sisters and me and told us not to be afraid, promised us that she would protect us. After the Americans left and with communists with that law soldiers entered our village looking to deliver death, it was she who had said, kill me before you kill my children. And now I would be killing myself. The thought of her disappointment, her anger, her loss drew the water from my eyes, and I unleashed my tears in a fine fall from my face. A cool wind blew when I stood before the old woman at the stall. From the veil of water in my eyes, I saw that she smiled at me in greeting. Her mouth soft and pink, her gums were bare. She asked, what can I get you today, young woman? I had never been a good liar. I turned my gaze toward the little packets of pills laid out on her table, I knew the truth was in my eyes, in the wash of tears on my face, but I didn't know which tiny plastic bag contained the pills I was looking for. So I looked lost. I said, I'm looking for silver cleaning pills. She answered, I don't have any. I had not expected her response. I raised my gaze, please help me. Her smile disappeared and she said, I would not sell you any silver cleaning pills today. I cleaned the blurry from my eyes. I asked, what other vendors carry the pills? She said, I don't know. It is a long line from here to the end. You walk and you ask them. This old lady does not have any for you today. I had somehow thought that death would be easy, for all of my life had been hard, and it was death that I had been running from the whole time. Now that I was ready for the encounter, this old woman was not going to help me. She was going to make it hard for me. I said, I don't know what you mean. I could see her clearly now, the white strands in the hair that fell from her bun. I could see her brown face, deep crevices of folded flesh, those steady, clear eyes looking upon me with concern. My hands, which had been cold, gripped the corners of the rickety table before me, a table filled with tiny packages of painkillers, 
herbal packages, box remedies, soap, toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoos, conditioner, everything a person may need in the course of a life. I lean toward the woman, she leaned toward me. Her old woman's hands fell atop of mine, they were warm and dry. Our heads were close when she said, I don't know whose daughter you are, whose wife or whose mother, but you will not be buying silver pills from me on this day. The tears that had just dried began suddenly again, earnestly. The rain that had drizzled on the walk became a storm of liquid I could not control. My throat clamped. My hands fisted in the last effort at control in the holds of her hand, her brown fingers tightened over mine. Her voice gentled. I would not let anyone else sell you silk cleaning pills today either. I pulled my hands free. I said, you can't do that. I wiped my tears and I turned from an offer that was not lost on me. She didn't look like my mother, but she reminded me of her. Years after, I can still hear her call after me as I made my way away from her table. Means I, I was not her daughter. I could never be. I walked tears falling free from one vendor to the next, asking for silver cleaning pills, feeling her gaze on my back the whole time. I defied her the way I used to defy my mother. By the time I reached the end of the line of vendors, I had only three capsules in my hands. None of the women would sell me any. A lone man had sold me three. He said they were his last three. Beside a grove of sugar cane, in a corner of the camp, I sat by myself on a flat rock. I did not want to be found dirty and wet, just dead. I had nothing to drink the pills down with. I had become too emotional. I wiped the tears from my eyes. I redid my bun at the back of my hair, cognizant that the early morning had left. And if I did not hurry, I would be found before the work could be done. I walked back to the market in a hurry. The slippery mud clung to my flip-flops. The romance of the morning was gone. I was suddenly exhausted. In my exhaustion, I fell. I lost one of the pills in my hands. When I got myself up, I could feel the wet of my sarong clinging to my legs. I had no more patience for me. I walked to the vendor with the drinks, the my flip-flops a mess of mud and bought a sweet drink, one of those syrupy drinks that my children liked, the kind that came from a plastic bag with a straw tucked at one end. On my way back to the sugar cane grove, I drank, I downed the drink and the two pills I had left. I sat on the rock. I raised my legs and I got my arms around my knees and I laid my tired head to rest. I understand that a child came upon me first and screamed. B said that he had been looking for me, that that earth had given him a clean track to follow. I wasn't meant to die that morning. B said when he heard the child scream in fear, he was already close. By the time he got to me, there was the fist coming out of my mouth. My eyes were rolled back. I had toppled on the ground. I woke up at the camp hospital. I heard the swirl of the fan over me. For a moment, I thought I had had another miscarriage. Another child had spilled from me. B was where he usually was, sitting beside me, his head in his hands. I closed my eyes again because I did not want to talk or to be talked to. I felt very much my own childishness then. I was in my early 20s. I was shy and embarrassed. I pretended to be unconscious for much longer than I was, but I could not pretend forever. <coughs> Soon enough, I had to ask about my children, not the ones who had died, but the ones who were alive. Soon enough, I had to hear my husband's cries and my own in response, first halting and quiet, and then loud, full of the ache inside of me. Soon enough, I must have gone pregnant again, and soon enough, I must have, had, I must have lost the next baby and the next. I'm going to go to the back. <coughs> we came to America. My mom gave birth to three living children, and then she had another miscarriage, and she said it was the hardest of them all. And this is what happened after. What happened after, despite the fact that this time we were in America and all those other times you were in the refugee camps of Thailand, was all too familiar. The baby came out and it was a boy. His eyes were closed and his hands were fisted. His body was the size of a bottle. I thought about this all the time in the days, weeks, months, years after. Whenever I fed my little ones at home with a bottle, 
I found myself late in the quiet of the night and early as the fingers of the sun began to slip into the heavy skies, holding the bottom of the way I would have housed my baby if he had been alive. It would take me the rest of my lifetime to meet him again. Thank you all. This has not been an easy book to put together or to write. These experiences have been among the most challenging, I think, in the lives of women and men. Because as Song Yao Shin, one of our contributors, says very, uh, I think, accurately, every living person that comes from the womb of a woman, of a woman an identified woman. Uh, it's hard to accept as a writer that, that this isn't a popular book. You know, our readings have been very small, but the truth is that some lives are not popular, and some stories will never be popular. They're just important, and they're just necessary, and they're just the reason why some of us hold on and continue on for the hopes of those who will come. So thank you all for being here for this unpopular, but most necessary work. stuff as but being unpopular is the least of our worries. It is a great honor to have my essay included in the collection in this book. Um, <clears throat> and it is a great honor to have it found its way there through the intervention of Peter Radcliffe. So, um, I am full of gratitude to be here today. My baby daddy's name is redacted because that is part of the terms of our divorce. <clears throat> I also will be funny, I hope. <laughs> <clears throat> I discovered, much to my shock and chagrin, that I wanted a baby of my own in the back of an auto rickshaw. It was June 2008. It was sunny, warm, comfortable, as it usually is in Mysore, India. I sat in the rickshaw with my cousin and her two-year-old, which by Indian familial logic makes her my niece. I'm Indian on my father's side. He immigrated in 1970. I'm Jewish on my mother's. She's from the Bronx. I visit my family in India often, and as my cousin and her daughter and I bumped along in the sunshine, the reddish dust. Deforestation is but one legacy of British colonialism. Puffed around us, mixing with the diesel exhaust. My knee snapped against me, her squishy body slowly turning solid as she passed from dozing to sleeping. I held her tightly enough to keep her inside the moving vehicle, loosely enough so she could sleep undisturbed. I can no longer remember where we were going or why. I just remembered a new need crawled out of my heart and took up resonance in my solar plexus. I had to remind myself to breathe. It's a good reminder. We should all take a breath. That June, I was six months into my first marriage. My husband and I had shared an ambivalence about whether we wanted children. We were leftist activists. <laughs> he was in law school. I was in creative writing school and working full time. We had a lot we wanted to do with ourselves. Travel, make change, have fun. Maybe, we thought, our lives would be full enough without kids. <clears throat> My husband and I agreed we'd start trying. He'd be almost done with law school. I'd be turning 30. He tried. 
He graduated. I got a new job. We tried. He got a postgraduate fellowship and then a new one in Baltimore. We tried. We moved. We tried some more. It was six months. It was 12. It was 18. People advised us to relax, which just pissed us off. <laughs> we decided to go on vacation, yes, to relax, and also to get away from people telling us to relax. Our options for a last-minute December trip close to the East Coast, BG, included Panama, El Salvador, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica. The latter one out. <clears throat> So in Costa Rica, we're on vacation, and uh, we discover I'm pregnant. I needed my husband, who's the only one who spoke Spanish, between us to teach me how to say pregnant in Spanish, to read the labels on painkillers, and the words to refuse uncooked vegetables, raw fruit, alcohol, and coffee. I used my phone to check baby center, which told me my embryo was the size of a lentil. We began to make plans, talk names, and dream. And then a couple of days later, I got really, really sick. Maybe it was the food. Maybe it was the flu. I stayed in bed for a couple of days, shooing my husband out to surf and drink cocktails and eat fresh fruit without me. When we started to bleed, we drove to the hospital in Punta Arenas. Even though it was my husband who spoke Spanish, it was me who made sense of the words from the doctor. Trumpa de Filapio. Ectopico emergencia. The doctor made sure to explain to us that it wasn't an abortion because the present pregnancy wasn't viable. Viable is the thing in English and Spanish. What he said was, it's not a sin. He said it over and over again. Neither of us told him I was Jewish, feminist, not Catholic. Neither of us told him we're for uh, we're for abortion on demand without apology. Neither of us told him much of anything. Because we were Americans with good health insurance and a healthy credit card limit, we took the calculated risk the doctor recommended. Drive to the Capitol for laparoscopic surgery at the private hospital. Go now, he told us, and don't stop for any reason. He said that repeatedly in Spanish and then in English. Don't stop for any reason. If my two burst, I could hemorrhage to death in the car. But you should be okay. <laughs> it was the middle of the night. The next day, we make it. The next day, a surgeon removed my lentil-sized embryo and the fallopian tube it was stuck in. Left to grow, the embryo I had wanted so badly to be my first child would have killed me. As a person of Indian descent, I'm familiar with lentils of many kinds and all sizes, fresh, dry, whole, split. Even now, 10 years later, when I wash lentils, I pinch the thin discs between my fingers and marvel that the tiny potential of a person can be packed into such a small package. So then I do IVF and it fails. And uh, we moved to Mississippi, which is stressful. Um, and uh, let's see. My Christian in-laws called often with positive thinking, encouraging voicemails. It wasn't their fault, but it pissed me off. I found myself holding the rational positions about the unlikeliness of its success. IVF, fail, IVF cycles fail 60 to 80 percent of the time. It was a bulwark. The faith that comforted my in-laws, my neighbors, the people on the internet, it grated on me. I began to dig into Jewish texts to understand what the teachings offer about what embryos are and how to make sense of bad luck in general. I began to bake challah on Fridays. It felt like the only way to find a space to live like a person, as the Yiddish expression has it. It's not unusual for infertility to strain a marriage. It's common that infertility makes people feel lonely. My first husband <clears throat> is a good, deeply feeling man, mostly. <laughs> 
but we were mired in our own very different experiences, our own childhoods, our own cultural and personal ideas of what it meant not to be able to conceive and what it meant to lose embryos. For him, I think they are children. I think he believes that, and I think his family does too. When he called my father-in-law from Costa Rica after the surgery to share the news that I had been pregnant and was no longer, my father-in-law said, for a little while I was a grandfather. My parents did not say such things. They focused less on the embryo and more on me. My mother said, it's sad but not tragic. You're dying would have been tragic. It's always good to know how your mom feels. Sometimes one's not sure. In all that, there's so little room for ambivalence. But ambivalence is a part of grief and infertility. For me, infertility provoked another internal conflict. Embryos are not people, and yet I have missed the people those embryos never became every day since I lost them. I expect you for the rest of my life, even as I am certain there is no such thing as a good abortion, the kind society says I have, or a bad one. All I know is that I walk around in a warm and living body that carries a brittle length of something hollow, full of dark, cold, missing person potential. Now we know that I spend my days building the solidarity we need for the world we ought to have. And I want to say that it is the most special kind of solidarity to be in this collection, full of very different ways of understanding what happened, and in a sisterhood no less strong for it. If anybody has uh, any questions, and the subtext is here to um, to sell books if anybody's interested, and we're all happy to sign. But yeah, if anybody has any questions or comments, um, please. And, and my contributors will stand up as as we see fit. Yes, Sue. Did you end up having triplets? Uh, no, uh, one of them died. So when I went into early labor at 17 and a half weeks, um, and after being upside down for a week and a half, uh, they tried to do a cerclage and it nicked the first baby's sack. And so he died instantly. Um, and then because my doctor believed in science, um, he had been researching different ways to preserve high-risk pregnancies, and he had come across an article from the Middle East from a doctor in, um, I think, the UAE, who had um, had a similar thing happen, but then had sort of tricked, uh, created this interesting trick uh, to help preserve the second fetus that was born. And so then he tried it on me, and it worked. So the child that uh, Peter referred to, who does History Day projects, Helena, was born at 28 and a half weeks with her brother Will, and they're both in St. Paul Public Schools, 17 years old. <laughs> Anyone? No. Yes. This is my second time hearing the stories. And I liked how you said that we were all born. And um, I just had this remembrance of what it was like to be a home birth mother and to hear birth stories after birth stories and uh, the things that can go right, the things that can go wrong. And I think that uh, this program just makes us all more human. And I love the fact that the men are here. And uh, yeah, so this is good work, and I feel like it's sacred work. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all for being here with us. Um, again, if you'd like to talk, or we'll be in the back, and we can we can talk more. And there's hot water for tea. Don't Thank you, Peter. Don't be in a rush to go. And then there are the pictures downstairs that I myself will look at. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Thank all. you all.